All right, we are live on Tuesday night. This is the Dr. Boz Show, and we have a great story for you tonight. Two women set off in life, and they meet in middle school. They become the best of friends, go through middle school and high school together, get married, have babies, raise their kids, share lives together, and find themselves 80 pounds overweight. One of them says, I'm done. I've tried every diet known to man. I give in, I'm going for gastric bypass. The other one says, I'm gonna try one more time and use a ketogenic diet. One uses autophagy and one does not. And we are gonna unpack what that means tonight on the show. Welcome to the Dr. Boz Show. We are so excited you are joining us. Thanks for the sound check and uh, nice to see all of you that are living through quite a storm out there in the universe. Um, come to Florida. <laughs> they do the weather great around here. I am starting out with one of the traditions on the show, and that is I am checking my numbers. I'm actually kind of curious because this week is uh, the second week of our, our class that I do, a live class where I walk a couple hundred students through uh, the intense cycle of what I ask my patients to do on the ketogenic diet. And this is the week where... You wake up on Sunday and you start eating sardines. And you can have as many sardines as you want, as many cans as you want. You just can um, not eat anything else. Um, uh, and that's my ketones. I am not fasting is what I'm trying to show you there. The glucose of 56, ketones of 2.3. Uh, I am gonna drink some ketones tonight, which I typically wouldn't do. Uh, I'm not letting the students do that during, during the course. What does that say? Uh, but we'll see if that um, can lift ketones that are already 2.3. I don't know. Um, I'll show you what I'm going to do. I have some bubble water. I have my pucker up. And we are going to get to this story tonight, which I really need to say. Let's see if I can snap that open without... Oh, there we go. Um, without getting it all over me. <laughs> I, I did that a couple times. Uh, we are going to uh, um, continue to tell a story that... Uh, I'll be honest, last week's uh, live was uh, about a this Ozempic craze. Uh, Ozempic being one of the drugs that's out there, been around for a while. It's an injectable medication that helps people lose weight. And I was explaining how the drug works, that it delays the gastric emptying, it makes folks feel full, uh, and they, uh, they therefore don't have the desire to eat as much. Okay, that's one way to lose weight. And they are um, really looking at um, the, um, the appetite suppressant as one mechanism for that drug, but it also stimulates the release of insulin. And I spend a, a great amount of time last week talking about how uh, they look funny. They have an ozempic face, Google that, just look at what it is. And it's because of something that's happening in the way, in the way, in the, in the chemistry set about how they're losing weight. And I feel like I'm doing a great job explaining this. And then this really smart person writes in and says, wait a minute, how are they losing weight if you stimulate the insulin? At which point I realize, oh, I have not explained this well at all. <laughs> so we're gonna unpack that because it is the insulin uh, and what that insulin is doing that changes the weight loss of somebody who is hitting autophagy and somebody who is not. So I just need to say again, write down your questions. We do answer them at the end. And I, I am super thankful for whoever wrote that question in last week. And I, I even had a tough time understanding what is he asking, but I'm like, oh, I didn't explain it that well. So thanks for the, thanks for the, um, the, uh, the tee up for this. Uh, this evening, and we have some slides for you to explain this because it is a question I get a lot. In fact, after that guy asked that question and I answered it, um, but I could have spent about 10 more minutes really unpacking it. A bunch of you wrote in and asked this question, like, how is that possible? What do you What do you mean that they're, uh, the way they lose weight is differently? So um, I'm gonna first explain that to lose weight, by definition, means you gotta get the resources that your body needs to live from the stuff stored in you. So one of those resources is, well, energy. So 
if you're on a ketogenic diet, uh, you've got pretty low amounts of glucose circulating around and you're not eating it, any glucose. Um, so if you're gonna lose weight, you're gonna have to use some of the energy that you're swallowing and then you're gonna have to find more energy in your body. The second thing that is critical to live is you need some amino acids. They are, they are vital, meaning you can't live without them. Uh, amino acids come from protein. And if you're not eating the protein, if you're having such low food, because you're losing weight by this point, especially on a low calorie, low fat diet, low amounts of protein, low amounts of food, and then the protein amount that you need in your body, well, you have to get it from the proteins in your body. So, and this is where the word autophagy becomes really important. We're gonna come back to that. All right, so um, we are gonna start out by talking about two different chemistry sets of these women that are the best of friends, that are 80 pounds overweight, and one of them says, I'm gonna try one more time with this crazy thing called a ketogenic diet. And the other one says, have at it. I'm, I'm going for the gastric bypass. And I think the gastric bypass happens a little sooner than the gal who starts the ketogenic diet. But now it's uh, three or four years, three years later, maybe four years later, uh, and they both have 80 pounds off. But the friend with the gastric bypass comes down to the, the friend who did keto. And the reason she came is because the one who does keto actually has a sauna in her house. And she says, can I come use your sauna? So uh, she's down there in the sauna and she's you know, getting done with her time in the sauna and she comes out and she's, she looks at her friend who is, has lost the same amount of weight uh, and they're both there in their birthday suits about to be in the sauna and the one friend who's lost the weight through the gastric bypass says, how much do you weigh? And by this time they've both lost this pretty good amount and they're around 150 pounds. And the one who lost the gastric bypass is a little bit heavier, maybe 10 pounds heavier. She's like, how is it that your body looks like that and my body looks like this? And if you go back to the thumbnail, that's the picture of the girl who lost the ketogenic diet, the one that's standing sideways. That's her actual side picture from today. She's like, I'm not at my ideal weight yet, but, um, but this is what my body looks like and hers um, well, we both started out at a size 16 or 18 before we lost this 80 pounds. And as she looks into my closet, she goes, what size of clothing do you wear? And she said, well, I, I wear a size four, the one who lost the weight through the ketogenic diet. And they're both within a half an inch of each other, five, eight, five, seven. Uh, the one who had the gastric bypass says, how is it that I'm only 10 pounds heavier than you and I'm still in a size 14? And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So let's get started. Uh, we are gonna uh, uh, get, take time for your questions and get to, to them at the end, so please type them in. Uh, we, we will uh, circle around and answer them. I do wanna just say hello to the, uh, lots of the folks out there. Hello to Jane, hello to... Uh, uh, Terry from San Jose, lots of our folks that are students in the classes, and boy, have we been talking a lot about this in the last uh, two or three lessons for this, uh, for the ketogenic journey that everybody's on, in the middle, the smack dab middle of their 21-day metabolic kick, and boy, are we kicking their metabolisms. I'm going to share one little thing before I hop over uh, to your slides, and that is, if you are super cool, uh, you have signed up to see me in Austin, Texas on April 21st. My little wrestler turns uh, 17 on the April 21st, and I'm choosing to be with you. What does that say? It says he has a test that day, and he said, Mom, you're not going to miss anything. I have to go to this test this day. <laughs> so I'm going to go to Austin, speak uh, to you guys. But I want you to know that as of tomorrow the price goes up. So right now you can still buy tickets for $200 for the three days, a great place to not only network, but um, really learn about what, what people in this ketogenic space are trying to share with one another, trying to educate you on, and really, um, I made some great friendships there. So I will be there speaking. I, I think I'm speaking on cholesterol. That's what I've said as of right now. Last year I changed my mind and I don't think I get the privilege of doing that again, but um, 
uh, I want you to be on the cool kids camp and come see me in Austin. Uh, and it's not in the middle of summer. It's April in Texas, which kind of sounds pretty good for these those of you in the middle of a snowstorm right now. All right, let's get to our slides. I, I do uh, uh, want to get through them because they are, oh, they're good. <laughs> All right, so we are going to talk through how can we see if somebody's got the right chemistry set to, to hit autophagy, to hit the place where your body uses the chemistry set inside your system to do the things that allow your body to go from that size 18 or 16, whatever it was, down to a size 4 when you lose 80 pounds, instead of going from a size 16 or 18 down to a size 14 because you did not hit autophagy during your weight loss. It is what I contend is happening with the folks who are using Ozempic. And we're going to explain what I mean there a little bit better. All right, so here is um, one of the graphs that I use to teach about what's going on with the chemistry set. And my students inside the 21 Day Kick are probably tired of seeing these kind of slides, but I think they're brilliant for showing you what I think about as I'm trying to help you say, well, you're not there yet. You need to stress your system. Um, all right, so here is a typical person, what I would call, they're, they're in the, the uh, keto continuum number five right here. Um, and, and that means that they've been on the ketogenic diet for a while. Um, they probably still have that fat-filled coffee in the morning. Um, they're insulin resistant. And the way I know they're insulin resistant is because their morning cortisol does that. Uh, and that's their blood glucose. Their blood glucose starts out somewhere around, I don't know, 90 in the morning. And before they ever wake up, their body gets a stimulus that says the sugars went up. And they wake up in the morning, they have their cup of coffee full of fat, which raises their sugars even further, and uh, they do a couple more things. They have an eating window uh, that has, uh, um, uh, that starts when, I don't know, about noon. If you can see this sun down here, that's about noon. And that eating window says yeah, that the, the first meal went in here, and the second meal is kind of when they get home from work. They really only eat two meals a day. And this is considered a, a really good rhythm for people in a ketogenic diet. When I'm looking to see how well is their metabolism doing, how well have they stressed their metabolism, the second thing that I would look at uh, is, well, what are their ketones doing? Um, let's just f figure out their average blood sugars here. Average blood sugar of 6.1 means they are diabetic or they've been really close to diabetes. 6.5 is where we officially say that, but um, if they've been close to it, they're trying to reverse it. And that average blood sugar is running around uh, the high 120s or about 130. Um, when they add the ketone measurements to this slide, um, you'll notice that during the night, they made some pretty good ketones. Here it was uh, at about the one level. Now, uh, when they're filled with all those carbs, their ketone level goes down. In between the meals, they start to recruit. They're pretty metabolically flexible. They start, oopsie, didn't mean to do it that high. Uh, they start to recruit um, those ketones um, out of their storage again. But as soon as they eat, those ketones plummet. And then they stay down kind of until the evening hours when they start to use ketones at night. That is a metabolically flexible person. This is very common to find, and when we have stressed their system, this is what it looks like. So the question is, are they in autophagy? Okay, so, um, and what sometimes we think they're in autophagy, and then they do this thing called a stall. And they're like, I don't know, doc, I'm doing exactly what you told me to do. I've been doing it now for three months, and it was working just fine. And now it's not working. And if you look behind the hood, if you open up and look at inside the chemistry of what is happening in their body, you'll find, number one, <laughs> that their uh, ketones in the morning uh, quickly go to nearly zero. I mean, maybe this is 0 0.2, but it's nearly zero. And that maybe they make a little bitty burp in between those meals. And I mean, here's 0 0.5. So if they hit nutritional ketosis, that would be stretching it, um, and then it goes back down when they eat that other meal. And during the night, they just don't need to produce that much. Okay, so why did that happen? That happened 
<laughs> because their body got healthier. The point of stressing your metabolism and then holding it is to make sure that your body says it's never going to overshoot producing energy, the resources to stay alive for too long. It's going to overshoot in a ketogenic state until it realizes you're in a rhythm. And then it's going to match your needs. Wasteful beings in the in the form of metabolism, well, that, that's not a thing. It, it's going to reach a steady state. The only way you can prevent it from hitting that steady state is that you have to intermittently stress it. And we're going to get to that. Um, but let's just say you're being the perfect keto patient and that's how you were losing weight. That's what the patient did who was on the ketogenic diet. Uh, she went through keto continuum one through four, had that total 20 carbohydrates, uh, was able to lose that weight um, and got her weight down to, you know, I think at the, before she hit her stall, before she did the, the things we're going to talk about next, I mean, she lost a good, you know, at least half the weight. Maybe it was a little more than that. And then she plateaued. And she stayed right there. Now she was hitting a little bit of ketosis and then she kept doing a few things that we'll talk about in a minute. Her friend did something very different. Her friend ate like this. Her friend focused on calorie restriction and after that gastric bypass she said yep every time I ate more than a few handfuls of food that's a very low amount of volume of food that she's eating there to spike her sugars up by about 15 points and then it would it would it would if she was wearing a continuous glucose monitor it would go back down and she would have one two three four small meals per day during that time she also had insulin resistance how do we know because she had this morning rise in her glucose just like the other girl did uh, and it was such a steady production of glucose that it was also a steady production of insulin, which prevented her from making any ketones. So she lost weight. She emptied fat cells in a low calorie restriction uh, based diet that did not spark autophagy. Uh, let's go to the next one where we can calculate to see if you are uh, making, if you are hitting autophagy. And the way we calculate that is we look at a Dr. Boz ratio which takes the glucose and divides by the ketones. Really what it's doing is it's measuring your insulin. That um, if I were to put you in a nice experimental IRB approved lab and say, let's check their insulin every minute of every day over the next four weeks, you would see that the noise from insulin goes up and down and 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 up and down. And, down. and yes, it changes dramatically when you, when you consume carbs, but it also changes pretty darn much when you eat particulated food, when you eat food that's been pulverized. The other word for that is processed food. A high carbohydrate processed food is the fastest way to raise your insulin. And when you raise insulin, you do not hit autophagy. You do not make ketones. Your Dr. Boss ratio will be a bajillion, be super high, not um uh, not lower. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. So if I go to here and I say, okay, so over the course of the, um, of producing insulin in a day, if insulin does this every time they eat, um, but even if it's, if they're stressed out, you can see insulin go up and then come back down. Um, if they're chronically stressed, you can see insulin hanging out here instead of hanging out here. And the problem is, is if you get your lab tested uh, right here, and I make a decision because we only check that insulin once every three months, but typically your insulin is averaging out here, that I'm giving, that's, an in, that's a, a false positive. I mean, it's falsely high when the average was much lower and I should have been making decisions on a, a much lower uh, content for their, uh, for their insulin. So measuring the Dr. Boz ratio, let's just go back and look at this again. The Dr. Boz ratio is measured by taking your glucose and dividing by your ketones. Those are the two molecules that your body looks at uh, or that insulin manipulates. Is it your glucose goes up uh, and that stimulates the production of insulin. When insulin goes up, it shuts off the production of ketones. So it is the ratio of these two that tell me well, how much insulin are they producing? 
And if you want to be in a state of uh, autophagy, you need to have a reduced amount of insulin from yesterday. And what does that mean? That means that if, if I want to hit autophagy, I need to be in a recent time where I've stressed your metabolism enough that I've lowered your insulin. And if I lower your insulin, I'm going to see it in that Dr. Boz ratio. Let's, let's, let's show you this a little bit better here. So if your Dr. Boz ratio is less than 40, um, I can say that about um, 80, let's use a better color than that. Uh, I can say that about 80 to 90% of the cells that can have autophagy are being stimulated. Maybe, maybe it'd be 60 to 80, it, but it's a pretty hearty amount. If you can get that Dr. Boz ratio less than 40, you are having autophagy in 80 to 90% of the places that you could. If you can only get your Dr. Boz ratio between 40 and 80, then you're down to only about uh, 30 to 40%. Of, the, of those cells that can recycle their, their and, and do this autophagy thing, which we're gonna unpack here in just a second. Um, but if your Dr. Boz ratio is over 100, the chances that you're recycling proteins is zero. Uh, the chances that you are in an autophagy phase is zero. Um, so let's go back to our example here. So here was our gal who was losing weight on the ketogenic diet. Uh, and eventually she hits a stall. But before she hit her stall, let's measure what is her Dr. Boz ratio. So right there in the morning, before she has her cortisol surge, um, her, her glucose came in at about, I don't know, 90, and her ketones came in at about one. So that's uh, 90 divided by one equals 90. Okay, so her Dr. Boz ratio is under 100. So at least she's getting some autophagy. And it's only a little bit every day. But when she goes in between those two meals, uh, or right before she has her meal, after that morning coffee went in, her Dr. Boz ratio is now, yeah, it's over 500. The chances she's recycling any proteins right there is zero. She's doing any of the autophagy type of weight loss is, un, is pretty much zero. So that's a blood sugar in the 130s and a ketone of like, what, 0.2 or something here. So yeah, pretty low. So let's go to right before she has her second meal. So now she's she ate around noon and it's now about 6.30 at night. She's making supper. If she were to check her numbers then, her ketones would be about one and her glucose would be about 100. And well, by golly, that gets her right on the edge. She may have a, like one cell <laughs> in her body did autophagy. But now when she goes to bed at night, she has several hours before she has that cortisol rise in the morning that's going to plummet her ketones. Why does the cortisol plummet her ketones? Because it sparks the release of glucose. When glucose goes up, insulin follows it. When insulin goes up, it shuts down the production of ketones. And you cannot have autophagy when the insulin is on the rise. Only when your insulin is a little better than yesterday uh, or in a season where your Dr. Boz ratio is less than 100 are you having autophagy. How much autophagy you're having is, well, how much did you stress the metabolism? So as I look over here and say, okay, what is uh, what does it look like for her friend who is doing the one, two, three, four meals per day? Well, her glucose stays nice and low. Her even her average of her glucose is probably, you know, pretty close to like five point eight. Uh, that's better than six point one. Six point one is up here. Um, Actually, five, yeah, 5 that would, that would probably be right. But look at those ketones. Yeah, those ketones are flatlined. They are zero, which is how our Dr. Bob's ratio is. Well, it's so high you can't measure it. She does not have one time where her, um, her loss of uh, weight is due to a autophagic process or a ketogenic state. She is losing weight like... Well, like we've been telling folks to lose weight for a long time, which is in the state of a um, low calorie uh, restricted diet. So if you've done a search for what, what happens inside these, uh, um, these places of, uh, like if you've done a Google search for Ozempic face, uh, why are they, you know, what, what is it that they're losing weight from? Um, 
yes, they are calorie restricted. Uh, they don't feel like eating. They end up eating very small portions, which is how they are able to lose weight. Unfortunately, the drug also goes into their pancreas and the little vacuoles of insulin that are waiting to be released, it pushes them out into the ether, out into the bloodstream. So their insulin rises, and if they were on the edge of producing a little bit of ketones, that doesn't happen, which is why they look funny. So what's happening that they're looking funny? Okay, so in autophagy, the word autophagy is, well, to eat thyself, right? Um, but it's very specific that it's trying to recycle protein. So you heard me say that you got to find the resources when you lose weight from inside your body. So you got a bunch of energy resources stored in your fat. And as long as you can get those fat cells to open, which you will do in a ketogenic state and you will do in a low calorie state, you just do it a lot easier in a ketogenic state and a lot more abundantly. But either way, you get some energy from fat and you have to use you have to recycle protein. So in the world of our human bodies, we don't take the protein from our left ear and then your, your cells don't like march it over to the gums on your tooth that needs a little repair and stick it in there. That's not how it works. What they do is they say, well, we need protein. We have two places to find protein. We can go to the muscle cells. And if we're in a, a, a time where resources are low and we haven't been able to eat in a while, well, that comes with a certain chemistry set in our body, which means that the calorie intake was low and so was the, um, um, the stimulus for insulin. And we're talking ancestrally, not like in 1950. In ancestrally, that when, um, when they're looking for protein, if ketones are in circulation, the last thing we wanna do is try to rob proteins from the muscles that are contracting. So actin, myosin, contracting, relaxing muscles. If that's the muscle that is in the body uh, trying to you, you know, to keep the body alive, trying to run after and be a hunter-gatherer, well, you do not want to touch those. You need those to survive to get the resources so that you get out of the famine phase. In modern day, um, low calorie is like the enemy of a ketogenic diet. Uh, because you're smoldering right on the edge to keep the insulin around. You are not in a state of ketosis. You're not in a place of this abundant release of fat for energy, but instead you're right on the edge of, of opening up the resources, but you're not quite there. And what needs to change in order for you to have those resources open is insulin. So in the Ozempic patient or in the patient who has the gastric bypass, because they both are having the same physiology. They both are re reduced stomach sizes. And even though the drug of Ozempic is what releases the insulin, her friend, I mean, along with most of the people that follow me, well, they're insulin resistant. They make insulin when they like look at food. I mean, they just are over producers of insulin. So it doesn't take hardly any food, especially if it's particleized, if it's even processed like powdered fat. <laughs> Sounds like a good thing on a ketogenic diet, but it raises your insulin that the particle size matters in today's processing of food. So here you have this, this ozempic patient or, or the gastric bypass patient, and you have the ketogenic patient. And in a state of ketosis, that ketone sends out a message, you cannot break down muscles that are actively being used uh, for the protein. You have to go somewhere else to find it. And that's autophagy. Autophagy is like the hound dog that sniffs out where is the buried bones? Where is the protein that's kind of, well, it's broken, it's defective? Or, you know, last week when you walked into the kitchen, you couldn't remember why you were there. Like, oh, there's a, well, there's a protein in your brain that's in the way of that signal. Uh, not really, but that, there's debris in your brain. And that is what makes us demented. That's what we don't clean up and recycle those proteins, whether they're tau proteins or whether they're just an old dirty cell that just needs to be thrown out and started over. Uh, it needs to be recycled. And when we move protein from one part of our body to the other, we got to go to that piece of protein. We got to break it into amino acids. The amino acids go out into circulation. They get into the cell that needs the amino acid, it goes into the nucleus, and then the nucleus uses that DNA to script out 
how well uh, uh, or how to make that protein. What's the recipe? And that's held in the DNA in your in your nucleus. When when I look at um, improving that uh, that um, process uh, of finding those broken proteins. Um, well, here's a picture of the difference between somebody who uses autophagy and someone who doesn't. So this is calorie restriction. And what I want you to notice is that in this calorie restriction, let's use, let's use purple. Um, okay, you see how this skin right here um, has no definition? Can you see that the skin right here, you can't see that it's bound to the muscle that's under it. Can you see the skin here that has these striations in, in the, the tissue because, well, what's under it is a whole bunch of proteins waiting to be recycled. They are not being used correctly. And in the state of weight loss, you have to recycle these, pro you have to get the proteins from somewhere. If you have ketones around, it's not gonna let you use muscle. I mean, it's the muscles in their face that's also changing. That's what they're going to the dermatologist to get injected for so they don't have ozempic face. But it's also the proteins in their arm and in their butt and in their legs. Uh, watch this. So in this patient here where they're saying, I am a size you know, 14, I, I'm only 10 pounds heavier than my friend who lost the same amount of weight, we're within a half inch of height, She's in a size four and I'm in a size 14. And it's because she has to fit all that into her clothing. And that is weight loss without recycling. So what do I mean by recycling? I want you to notice here's the top layer of skin uh, and the muscle for the skin is down here. Let's look at that a little bit closer. So um, here, here I'm gonna draw the muscle in red. This is where the muscle lies, um, but it is this part of the, of the skin that needs to connect to the muscle in order to have muscle definition after you, after you lose weight. To not have saggy skin means these two areas need to connect. And that means you gotta recycle this little green thing there, and you gotta recycle that, and you gotta recycle that. And these blood vessels are made up of a whole bunch of protein. Well, you gotta recycle that. Um, Let's use this. You need to re well, that one doesn't show up very well either. <laughs> you need to recycle that one. Uh, you've got this mucinous gland here that squirts out some oil. Well, you don't need nearly as many of those when you have all this fat gone. Um, here's a couple of other uh, glands and mitochondria and connective tissue. All the stuff that's supposed to be connecting this, you got to erase this in order to lose weight and not have loose skin. And the only way you can do that is when that Dr. Boz ratio. Well, if it's less than 100, you're doing a little bit. If it's less than 80, you're doing a little bit more. Less than 40, you're doing a little bit more. And for my hardcore patients, <laughs> it's less than 20. But that doesn't mean you check it once. And this beautiful woman has this picture, which is, check that out. That is muscle definition. There is no striation in her arms for where the muscle doesn't connect to the skin anymore. Those little lines that were in the, the previous picture are because the distance between the muscle and the skin is a long ways. And the cords pulling on it to, to reconnect, I mean, it really does want to reconnect. Well, it, it ain't, there ain't a chance it's gonna reconnect. And you look at her muscle definition where that, you can see that dimple right here where the, the muscle outlines uh, uh, is outlined by her uh, definition well, that is where she's smack dab, has the skin touching the muscle because she used autophagy. And in, as you look at these comparison uh, arms, um, it, it, to hear uh, Angie's story is really inspiring because she got frustrated just like anybody as she's losing weight and she hit this plateau. And she's like, I'm in this plateau. I'm doing everything you tell me I'm supposed to. And I, I know that I've heard the word autophagy before. And I, I'm super frustrated because the darn scale hasn't moved at all. And a few weeks ago, I talked about how important it is to lose, lose weight rapidly and then hold. And during the hold, I still need you to be touching autophagy enough to be recycling those proteins. Because she's like, 
finally, I, I just I, I I decided to do my measurements, and I had lost 19 inches in my thigh in the six weeks. 19 inches circumference in her thighs in the six weeks where she was super frustrated because the weight didn't come off. And she goes, I went to buy pants. And, you know, when you've been overweight for a while, uh, you, you may have lost weight, but your brain still says, I'm overweight. I've been overweight. I'm going to be overweight. And she goes, so I went in and I said, I, I, I think I need new pants. Um, and she had been like a size 16 or 18 or something. So she says, well, let's, si- let's try a size 12. And she gets the size 12 in and she's like, oh, wow, these are too big. Let's try a size 10. So the lady brings her back a size 10. She's like, okay, these are too big. She goes, I was a size eight. And I I mean, she hadn't lost all of the 80 pounds yet, but she was like, I'm looking in the mirror. I've tried on like a couple of size eights. It really does fit. But the woman in the mirror that I see is still, is still this woman who suffered for 25 years about being overweight. And I can't see a size eight in the mirror. And I realized, well, that, that's, that's, that's not right. I should be able to see me in this. And in those processes where she, her body is recycling uh, those proteins, who is hitting autophagy enough to spark the next layer of weight loss, to recycle the proteins so that she doesn't have a size 14. I mean, she, you, you get back to the story I was telling at the beginning of the, the, the show, where she, they're standing there in the birthday suits about to go into the sauna. And one is a size four. And one is a size 14. And one spent at least $50,000 on a weight loss surgery. And then she had this physical restriction about how much she could eat. But her understanding of what to eat, why are you eating, and are you getting any pleasure out of this journey of losing weight? Are you identifying with this new version of you uh, which both programs do this. I mean, I mean, we take we talk about this. People in a in a gastric bypass uh, program talk about this. Uh, but somewhere deep in her in her identity, uh, the person with the gastric bypass says, "I lose weight because somebody else did something to me," and and unfortunately, that something did not include autophagy. Let me finish up these last couple of slides. So you say, yep, that is uh, that success of losing weight while doing autophagy is why she went, they both lost 80 pounds. They both are the same height. One's in a size four, one's in a size 14. So what did I tell the person who said, okay, so I'm flatline, doc. I, I haven't lost weight. And I've stabilized, like you said, and I've got this 19 inches that is off my thighs. What's the right thing to do now? Um, the most powerful thing that I, and the most common uh, thing that people skip is you see how this eating window here uh, starts at, um, oh, what would that be, like seven o'clock at night? And then it, it, or actually it starts at around, you know, right after lunchtime, or not, right after noon, and it goes to seven o'clock at night. We take that and we move that eating window towards sunrise. That's how you change, that's how you stress the metabolism. And what happens in the background is, yep, those ketones do exactly what they were doing uh, throughout the night. They start out at a very, you know, similar place where they were before. Um, And when you get to the first meal, still not great. I'm not going to have much autophagy happening there, but she eats her morning meal. And then by the time uh, that, you know, that next meal is about to happen, um, she has hit a Dr. Bob's ratio where at least she had a few cells recycle. She puts that next one in and then starts what is the best uh, phase for losing weight. And that is what happens while you sleep. And she recruits a whole bunch of ketones to go up while she's sleeping. And her glucose goes down and her insulin is what was plummeting during this time. And every day that she can get away with um, with decreasing uh, that insulin is a higher spark the next day for autophagy, for recycling those proteins. I think that's the end of my slides. Just double checking there. Um, yes, that's it. Uh, okay, when, when I look at the, the uh, improvements that somebody has on a ketogenic diet, I want them to not use their muscles. I don't want them to recycle the protein out of their muscles. 
And the number one best way that they can do that, the number one best thing, I have my little wrestler at 16 years old trying to cut weight to make his weight for wrestling while being this, as strong as possible is to make sure there's ketones in circulation. You're going to lose the weight with a high fat, low volume food until you weigh in on Thursday. And then he does things like eat peanut butter. Like he doesn't listen to his mother all the time. But uh, <laughs> that that's a different day. And if anybody has any uh, serum for all teenage boys to listen to their mother, I'm buying some. <laughs> uh, but in the spirit of most of my patients that are trying to lose weight in their in their 70s, in their 80s, the last thing we want you doing is touching the muscle mass that you need to hang on to every spare muscle fiber after the age of 50. Making new muscles after 50 is possible, but it's a heck of a lot easier to keep them. And to do that, you need a signal that says, do not use the proteins that are active. Use the ones that are dingy, that are the trash proteins between the brain cells in my left, uh, can't remember where I came into the kitchen for. Uh, use the proteins in my armpit that I haven't touched in a couple years. Use the proteins from that arthritis that has been uh, hurting me for the last 20 years. Uh, those are the proteins that you can recycle. Use the proteins that used to keep the fat in place between my muscle cells and my skin. And as you lose weight, you gotta remove that tissue or you're going to have saggy skin. Okay, that's, that's Ozempic face. <laughs> one is using autophagy, one is not. And the stimulation of insulin is the difference. All right, I am going to uh, do one other little announcement and then go over to your questions. So please be writing them in. My, my team is helping me get those recycled uh, into, um, uh, into the sheet so I can read them. A couple of things that I do want to point out. Um, uh, I do have a, a, a few folks that wrote in over the past week asking me some of uh, the things that I recommend. In my Dr. Boz class, we do this awesome, uh, um, do this awesome um, uh, data sharing, and we use the Keto Mojo dashboard to do that. Um, as a result, uh, if you come in here on the Dr. Boz page and you click on here, you can get a, you can join us by using the meter that I use inside there as well. Uh, people say, what happened to Foracare? Well, Foracare is still here. It's still a very good meter, uh, especially if you're looking to check your uric acid. Uh, uh, Mojo doesn't do that. Mojo does a lot of great things, but it doesn't check uric acid. And um, there's a few other things that uh, Foracare does as well, but the biggest thing that uh, I use it for now is, is the measurements of uric acid. Um, they do have a couple things in their 2023 year that they're after. This is also the place where I put all the things that I think are cool. Uh, so here is the four uric acid um, uh, strips that I think are worth it. And then anytime you put in DRBOZ, <laughs> most of these have a promo code of DRBOZ for getting some of that off. The other thing is, you know how Amazon plays this nasty little trick of uh, if you don't leave a review, it nothing happens. So I finally, <laughs> after a year of fighting with Amazon, um, have got my hemoglobin A1C test that I partner with Omega Quant. Uh, it's finally available on Amazon and you cannot find it anywhere <laughs> without working really hard. Uh, but if you noodle around, if you go to the Dr. Boz page on Amazon and you buy the hemoglobin A1C, please leave a review. Please leave a review. Just say hi to Dr. Boz. That's all I care. Give me a, a review uh, because I can't get out of the ditch in the metrics of finding that silly test on Amazon until someone leaves a review. And turns out I can't leave a review for myself. That's against the rules. All right, let's go to your questions, everybody, uh, and see if this uh, if this lecture hit home with you guys. I, uh, I, I want to thank the students that uh, asked me their questions inside the 21 Day Metabolic Kick this last week, because it's because of you <laughs> that I was like, oh, I need to explain that better. And I practiced on them before I got to tell you guys how I was going to explain this. Let's go to your questions. So we start out here with Becky. Um, Becky has said, what would happen if you combine Ozempic with a keto way of eating? I have a friend with a tremendous amount of weight to lose and wants to try this. Well, the, that's actually a good question. Um, again, what's going to happen with Ozempic is that you're going to have a decrease in gastric emptying 
You're also going to have um, a stimulation in insulin. Now, is it enough insulin to overcome uh, a ketogenic state? No, um, you are fighting your enemy hormone for weight loss when it stimulates insulin, but you can still lose weight. Um, I mean, the key to weight loss that is sustainable, that has the right proteins recycled. I mean, you lose all the weight, you have a cute little derriere, but you look like those pictures do, or you have a brain that's not working right. Like, what's the what's the point of that? You're a cute person in the nursing home? Pick somebody else, not me. When people are using Ozempic to lose weight, I I, I mean, I think here's here's the reviews I've read on the doctor pages where what, what, what kind of issues are you having? Um, I mean, all the doctors that are on that page say, yep, you can tell when they walk in. They, there's something gaunt about their way they're losing weight. Um, now, there's not a lot of people using the ketogenic diet and Ozempic. Um, so it, it isn't that it's not possible. It's that the steps that require you, I mean, the difference between that gastric bypass patient and the one who used a ketogenic diet is that the ownership that you're going to have to figure out how to eat in a window that isn't somebody else's window and isn't, uh, I'll eat in my eating window and then I'll just have a, a little carrot here or a little like, keto snack here or a bunch of mints outside of you. No, eating window is an eating window is an eating window. And that ownership of changing how you think about food is step one in sustainability. Um, I, I don't doubt that there are people out there on the ketogenic diet using Ozempic, uh, but I'd be checking your numbers every day. I would be looking, did you hit autophagy? Uh, because if not, the price you're paying is the sacrifice of resources called proteins in your muscles that are being broke down. And that's what happens in a low calorie diet. That's why most of the doctors say, when I stop the Ozempic, the cravings come back like a rage, which is typical of most of the weight loss things that we do. When they're using it for diabetics, you say, great, they lose the weight. but. I'm here to remind you that type 2 diabetes is a choice. You are eating way too many processed carbs for way too many hours of the day for way too many years. And it has created a chemistry set that puts on weight, that ages your body, and that inflames your system. Ozempic's expensive, so for heaven's sakes, if she's got it, use it. But know that it is not, it is a bridge of a tiny chapter to get her in the right direction and really kind of manning up saying, I wouldn't do it to my best friend. I would say, no, come to my support group. Just keep showing up, even if you screw it up. And be in a relationship to say, you are more than the food you eat. There is a better journey out there. So uh, even when they have that tremendous amount of weight to lose, I mean, I, uh, oopsie, wrong one. Uh, as, a, as a physician, I would, I would warn them about it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's go to Sue. Uh, does autophagy work well for 75-ish as well as for a 40-age woman? So the cool part is, is according to the research that I've read, um, when you stimulate autophagy, the recycling process, I mean, there's, there seems to be a different rate in people, uh, like how quickly can they recycle some proteins and how quickly, uh, it's almost like how quickly can they push their ketones up and their glucose down. Today in the 21 day course, we did this case on somebody who's been 550 pounds. And in the first wave of weight loss, he lost like, he lost 280 pounds and he was still weighed 280 pounds. And he kept most of that off, but then gained about 60 of it back and has been in this fight to keep the weight off for many years, but, but really has started to pay the price of what happens when uh, when the body's age uh, is older than his stated age, and part of that is because of how inflamed it's been. So in his quest to lose weight, he has, well, he has a fantastic mother. Uh, and I say that because of his mitochondria. He can make ketones, I mean, just in a heartbeat. And I think it relates to how well is he going to have autophagy. When, we, when I look at the, the the metrics of somebody's metabolism and how well they're seeming to be able to turn over these recycled proteins. There seems to be a parallel in those same patients that are able to just make ketones better than the rest of us. And and that's a thing. I see that. Um, the Down syndrome patient with the mom who helped her lose the 
weight but didn't have any memory improvements. And then she goes on a ketogenic diet and she in six weeks gets off of her memory things. Uh, great case. But those ladies, they make ketones better than anybody I've met. Like they are ketone makers. And again, it's mom and daughter. So it's the same mitochondria. This man that's been 500 pounds says, yeah, my mom's 95 or in her 90s, sharp as a tack and a strong metabolism. And, and then when you look at his numbers inside the class, boy, he just like, he has a hiccup and he makes ketones. He's like a great ketone maker. So I think there's something, there's some parallel to that. Um, and from the stuff I've read, it, it seems to connect with, with what they've said. Uh, okay, let's keep going here. All right, Paulette says, <laughs> can you drink pucker up during the fasting window? Well, the best part about the pucker up is, um, well, there are no carbs in there. <laughs> there's also no sugar substitutes. This is not for wimps. This is sour. Now, I happen to like sour, and I also have a husband who, as much as I would have him ha have something that tastes much better, this has stevia in it, and he's allergic to stevia, so he couldn't have that. Um, the reason you would take um, pucker up, I'm going to add a little bit more water to my, my thing here, uh, during a fast is... Well, to show you, can I raise my ketones? I'm kind of doing a little experiment here saying, I don't know, ketones are 2.3. Can I make them go any higher? The best way to make my ketones go up are, well, do what we're doing in this fast, which is a whole bunch of sardines, nothing else, nothing else. The 72 hour starts with the first can, and on the 72nd hour, you need to eat the last can. And I don't care how many times during those, there's not an eating window during the sardine challenge. It's as many cans of sardines as you want. And... Watch what happens to your glucose, watch what happens to your ketones. But you can't start the timer till the first can goes in, and you don't stop the timer until the last can goes in on the 70, 72nd hour. I need 72 hours of sardine replacement. And that's a fantastic way to see ketones go up. But not everybody does that. <laughs> and it seems to be something that even inside a classroom of all this positive peer pressure and people doing things they didn't think that were possible, um, well, <laughs> Some people are pretty owly and they got kind of crabby and that's okay. <laughs> they were really addicted to their carbs more than they thought they were. Um, and if they were alone, they probably would fall off the wagon and go in the ditch for a while. And what what I look at, what um, what would be the most important part is, well, don't let all your cellular parts that know how to use a ketone and know how to create a ketone go down. Um, pucker up is a great answer for when I'm trying to get my cancer patients to get their Dr. Boz ratios to 20 or less. And there's no way they can drink enough ketones to get it that high. But when you put ketones in circulation, it sends a signal. Not only does it send a signal, don't use their proteins for your amino acids. Go find them somewhere else. Look in the trash. Uh, it also sends a signal that ketones beget ketones. So when ketones are in circulation, you make more ketones. It's it's a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, like, oh, we got to make more, we got to make more. So there's no way you can drink your way into a 2.3 ketone production. I mean, well, you might be able to like burp your weight, like one one number might be there if you're lucky to test it at the right minute. But that they're going to end up in your urine. You, you have to keep them in circulation. So you, you still have to be heading towards a ketogenic way of eating. So in my fasting window, I don't want really to think of this as fasting. I think of this as a sardine challenge, and I want to see if they'll go up. Okay, uh, a couple of more questions, and then we'll... Oopsie, wrong one. Dang it. All right. So, my carnivore life writes in and says, do you recommend higher fat for women in menopause? I recommend for people in menopause to hit a good Dr. Boz ratio. So it's the difference between some of the other uh, plans out there where they're, you know, talking about different ways to um, to do keto at different seasons of life. And personally, I don't care what season of life you're at, your chemistry should still be the same. You should still have ketone production and a glucose that isn't overly high. We, we, we can, I can, I've done hundreds of hours of lectures on this to say, that's really what you're looking for is if you want your fat-based hormones like estrogen and progesterone to be the healthiest they can in menopause, to be as stable as they can, to have your growth hormone be as stable as possible. All of those require, a keto, you know, they do better in a ketogenic state. 
And if you're not in a ketogenic state and you've been around the sun a good 60 times, you're probably a pretty good producer of insulin. Uh, maybe you're an even insulin resistant. You've been overweight. Uh, so that means you now need even more attention paid to your glucose and ketones at the same time, especially in the morning. So um, most people need to have a pretty good amount of fat to do that. I would challenge you if you're in your uh, menopause and you're saying, well, how can I get a better number? Open that can of sardines, set the timer for 72 hours, and you have to eat the final can on the 72nd hour. No snitching. All right, Tom writes in and says, I am going for hip surgery in a week. Just some advice about staying in ketosis during recovery. Sardines. <laughs> um, other thing, I mean, the other thing that if you've been in, in the ketogenic diet, um, the other thing that does work really well is... To, to supplement with MCT. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of volume. Um, it, you know, if you can talk to the doctor not, about not putting glucose <clears throat> into, your, um, into your IV drip, that's also nice. Uh, if you're keto, you don't need it very much. Um, I mean, today we had a guy who's just new into this and his, he, well, he's been keto, but we've really been pushing him over this last week and a half, or what are we, 10 days, uh, nine days into this challenge. Uh, and he uh, he had a blood sugar in the 37. He's like, I, am I gonna die? I'm like, well, look at you. <laughs> you can talk. You're not shaking. Your ketones are higher than they've been all week long, and your glucose was low at that moment. But um, you know, 20 minutes later, it wasn't low, but uh, it, it was about 20 points higher. So I think his body was in the middle of fixing it. But when you try to tell somebody that that's not been keto, they'll think you're crazy. All right, we'll do a couple more questions. And then we'll check these numbers. Okay, must eat for medication right now, morning and night. I used to fast two to three times a week. So when I use the word fasting, I'm saying that you go without any calories for at least 36 hours. So if you were doing it two to three times a week, so that would be like you eat a meal on Sunday and then you eat a meal again on Tuesday morning or maybe Tuesday night. And then you don't eat on Wednesday and then you eat a meal again on Thursday, and then you don't eat on Friday, and then you eat on Saturday and Sunday. Okay, so maybe you could, okay. Highly insulin resistant. I'm saying if you're highly insulin resistant, I would not be fasting that much. You're just pushing your cells to shut down. I would take the eating window, narrow it to about four hours, five hours, whatever it works for you, slide it towards sunrise. That cortisol rise, that's happening in you too. And so, unfortunately, you're having a glucose spike and you never ate a calorie. You didn't eat a thing, but your body released a bunch of glucose because you're insulin resistant and cortisol happens every morning. You cannot change that. You just have to live within it. So open your eating window in the morning. I recommend sardines. Um, and if you're stalled since April, yeah, you're fighting your chemistry. That's not, not going to happen. Sauna is nice, but... Do sauna after you fix your eating window. Uh, you're, you'll have more. I mean, it's all going to be a bit of pain. Standing in a hot sauna for 19 and a half minutes is not easy. But don't do that until you get your eating window figured out. And I don't mean fasting. I mean your eating window opens at sunrise. It closes four hours later. And that means nothing else goes in your mouth. That's how you fix insulin resistance. Tony says, um, how do I eat a... How do you do a fat fast? Uh, do you recommend this first of all? No, do a sardine fast. Do a sardine challenge. Like, yeah. And then uh, do, Patricia, I do a weekly 72-hour fast on keto. Uh, do the weekly 72-hour fast on keto lower the background metabol metabol metabolism rate? Well, my students are going to be able to answer that question for you in the next... Um, I think we really sat in 48 hours where they're going to get us awesome lecture on the science of fasting and why I can't answer that question until I know what it is you're doing before that. Which part of the keto continuum are you on? And I don't mean if you've been there for a week or two. I mean for three months or at least a month, you've been at the same keto continuum and you open your eating window and you close your eating window and you've got numbers behind it. Then I can answer that question. When people start, show up and say, I did a 72-hour fast, I'm like, I don't care. 
Uh, was your metabolism ready for that? And if it was, you're going to get this awesome benefit. And you'll know without asking the question that the metabolic rate does not change as long as you're sparking growth hormone during those 72 hours. But you can't do that de novo, especially if you're insulin resistant. So if you're looking for the Cliff Notes, that book, Keto Continuum up there, the workbook, that's the cheapest way to get from beginning to end. Fill out the pages. Don't skip the pages that are hard to do. Fill out the pages one at a time and you will find metabolism that will rescue you on the other end. All right, we're going to end with um, a uh, check of my sugars. Did that? Did it raise my sugars or not? And then you know what I get to eat after this? I get to eat sardines. Uh, let's see. Here is my ketones. And then we do have on our end screen this, this week, um, I teach you how to increase your ketones uh, and the best way to reach autophagy. Uh, that video has done really well. So if you like, uh, you want to learn a little bit more about that, click on that. It's a great uh, short, not so rambly like these lives are, a teachable moment. But I also uh, think it'll dive you into um, something that you can share with people when they're saying, what are you talking about? What do you mean? They're not going to be as dedicated as you and sit through a, an hour live. All right, here's my ketone. Oh, this is ketones. Here's my ketones. And here's my glucose. Mm. Okay, so we got keto glucose of 55 and ketones of, drum roll, 3.3. Oh my gosh, they went up. Okay, so. Now I'm gonna go eat sardines. <laughs> For all you students that are checking in with me in the morning, I can't wait to show you my numbers. <laughs> we will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in everybody and we hope you learned something. If you did, share this video